The thought of reincarnation terrifies some people and pleases others. Personally, I hate the thought of having to relive an entire life all over again. It not only scares me, but it's mentally exhausting just to think about it. Judging by some of our stories, you can end up in the same culture, doing the same things. So where's life's lesson in that? It makes it seem that I'm going back onto a treadmill that I cannot get off of. We've discovered six astonishing reincarnation tales, some of which will give you hope, while others are surrounded by disturbing circumstances. Number 6. Romy Crease, Iowa, USA Romy was born in 1977 to Barry and Bonnie Crease of Des Moines, Iowa. Her parents were devout Catholics and so were completely unprepared for what happened when she began to talk about her past life. She would talk about her previous life as Jo Williams. She had insisted that she had grown up in a red brick house in Charles City, a town 140 miles from Des Moines. She said that she had married a woman named Sheila and they had three children. Romy claimed that both Joe and Sheila had been killed in a motorcycle accident that Romy described in considerable detail. She also feared motorbikes and would have a panic when one zoomed past. She was also able to recall other incidents from Joe's life where he'd started a fire in the home and his mother, Louise Williams, had burned her hand trying to put out the fire. Romy also claimed that his previous mother complained of a pain in her right leg, which had also injured in the fire. Romy often asked to be taken back to Charles City because she wanted to reassure her previous mother, who he called Mother Williams, that everything was okay. They eventually visited Charles City, where Romy insisted they buy Mother Williams some blue flowers, as they were her favourite. And that when they arrive at the house, they must not use the front door, but go to the back door. After checking the phone book, they found a Louise Williams listed, and Romy was able to direct them. When they arrived at the house, to their amazement, there was a note on the front door requesting them to use the back door. An elderly woman answered holding a crutch with a bandage on her right leg. Louise Williams was ecstatic to receive the flowers and said she had never had any flowers since her son Joe had given her some many years before. Romy then told her everything about her past life as Joe, where Louise Williams could not believe how she knew all of these facts and confirmed everything Romy had said, saying, Where did this girl get all this information? I don't know anyone living in Des Moines. She explained that she and Joe had lived in a red brick house, as Remy had said, but this house had been destroyed by a tornado that had damaged much of Charles City ten years ago. Joe helped us build this house, and he insisted we keep the front door shut during the winter. Louise Williams was able to confirm many details of Romy's narrative about Joe, including his marriage to Sheila, their three children, the names of other relatives, and the fire in her home in which she had burned her hand. She was also able to verify Romy's precise description of the motorcycle accident in 1975, two years before Romy was born. Louise showed her a family album where Romy was able to identify everyone in the photos. Despite this confirmation, neither she nor Romy's parents were prepared to accept the possibility that her daughter was the reincarnation of Joe Williams. I don't know how to explain it, and I find it hard to believe, observed Romy's mother, but I do know my daughter isn't lying. Number 5. Courtney Perosco, Louisiana, USA When Courtney was three years old, she was sitting at the table, scribbling on some paper, and casually said to her mother, I miss my Grandma Alice so much. Her mother then said, Who is Grandma Alice? Courtney replied, well, she is my grandma. Then her mother replied, you already have two grandmas and neither of them are Alice. Courtney said, well, I know that, but 
Alice was my grandma before I was Courtney. She claimed that Grandma Alice and her grandfather had looked after her when their parents had died. Unfortunately, her grandma had died when she was 16. Her mother then said, Well, I'm glad you're with me now. Whereas Courtney replied, well, Yes, I know that you love me, and that is why Grandma Alice had recommended you for me as my new parents on Earth. Courtney then talked more about her previous life, describing that she'd lived near hills where the trees lost their leaves before winter and that the winters were very cold and not like here in Louisiana. The house had no indoor toilet and in winter it was freezing to go to the toilet outdoors. Courtney said that when you first arrive in heaven, you're allowed to rest for a while. Then you have to work and what you want to learn in your next life on earth. Then you choose a family that will help you learn and what you need. Her mother asked her whether she'd met God and Courtney replied that yes, she'd only seen God with her soul. Her mother could not believe what Courtney had said from a child so young. And where did she learn about such things when none of these subjects had ever been discussed at home? Number 4. Nakati Unataskadin Adana Turkey. The Islamic faith is the main religion in Turkey, where officially no one believes in reincarnation, even though some Islamic sects either partially or completely acknowledge that reincarnation exists. One case is about a boy from Adana, Turkey, called Nakati Unlataskadin. As soon as Nakati was able to speak, he talked about his past life. He said that his name was Nise Budak, and that he lived in Mersin, Turkey, and his wife's name was Zeda, and they had many children. His best friend was Ahmed Renkli, who he would regularly visit with his son Najat. Tragically, on one occasion, they had a serious argument where Ahmed stabbed him to death. After much prompting from Nikati, his parents decided to take him to visit Mersin, which was a hundred kilometers from their home in Adana. He was not only able to find the house he once lived in, but also recognize his previous wife, Zara, and was able to identify and name all of his children except for the youngest, whose name he did not know because he'd been born after his death. He was also able to answer all of the questions that were put to him. Lakati also claimed that it had an argument with his previous wife, Zara, where it stabbed her in the knee and pointed to the part of her knee that he'd injured. When Zara lifted her skirt, it revealed a large scar in the exact spot that he had pointed to. It was also confirmed that Nikib's friend Ahmed had indeed stabbed him to death when Nakati now had birthmarks where he had been stabbed in the previous life. Number 3. William George Jr. Alaska, USA In 1949, William George Sr of the Tlingit tribe was an Alaskan fisherman and said to his son Reginald that when I die I will come back as your son. When I am reborn you will recognize me because I will have birthmarks like the ones I have now where he pointed to two prominent birthmarks on his body. He then handed his son a gold watch given to him by his mother and he then said keep this watch for me for when I return as your son whereas he took the watch home to his wife, who placed it in a jewel box where it stayed for the next five years. In August 1949, William George Sr. disappeared from the boat, which he was captain, and searchers never recovered his body. Short time later, Reginald's wife became pregnant and gave birth on the May the 5th, 1950, barely nine months after his father disappeared. Apparently, during a labor, William George Sr. had appeared in her dream, saying he was waiting to see his son. When the child was born, they found he had birthmarks identical to the ones on William George Sr., just as he'd predicted to his son. So they named the child after his father, William George Jr. As William George grew up, they observed behaviour similar to his father's. However, one amazing incident was that when William George Sr. was young, he'd severely injured his ankle in a basketball accident and walked 
with a distinctive limp on his right foot. The young boy had developed the same limp on his right foot, even though he had never injured it. As the young boy matured, members of the family noted that he had similarities of facial appearance and also had his posture and an amazing knowledge of boats and fishing. He knew the best places to fish and knew how to work the nets, but had a fear of water. Other unusual observations was calling his great aunt his sister and his uncles and aunts his brothers and sisters. One day in the bedroom, his mother had opened the jewellery box and had spread everything out onto the bed, including the gold watch that William George Sr. had handed to his son. William George Jr. then walked into the room, saw the watch on the bed stating, Hey, that's my watch. Both parents swore they had never mentioned the watch to their son. Number 2. Rina Gupta, New Delhi, India When Hindu girl Rina Gupta was only two years old, she told her mother that she had a husband, a very bad man who had murdered her. Rina's behaviour became even stranger, where she would toddle out onto the balcony of a New Delhi home and stare into the street crowds, searching, always searching. When out in the family car, she was constantly on the lookout for someone. When asked what she was looking for, she would say, I'm looking for my husband and my children. Rina then began to criticise the way her mother cooked and cleaned the house. On one occasion, Rina wandered off during a market outing, only to explain later to her worried mother that she had followed a woman who used to come to my house. The past life connection wouldn't go away, and to her mother's annoyance, her daughter continued to express affection for her children, as well as anguish at her enforced separation from them. One day, a woman called Vijendra Kaur, a teaching colleague of Rina's mother, had heard about a Sikh family in another part of the city whose story appeared to match Rina's. Her inquiries led to Sadar Kishan Singh and his wife, parents of the late Kadeep Kaur, who had been murdered by her husband on June the 21st, 1961. After being informed about what Rena had been saying and intrigued by a possible link with the dead daughter, the couple called on the Gupta family. At the time of their visit, Rena was asleep, but on waking, she looked up at the Sings and her face lit up with smiles and she said, They are my mother and father. The next day, the Sings brought Swarna, Gudip's younger sister, to see Rena, who immediately called her by a nickname, Sano. Later, Rina visited Kishnan Singh's home, where she recognised photographs. Her previous husband, Sajit Singh, the killer of Kadeep, heard of Rina's claims and decided to pay the family a visit himself. Rina, however, had no wish to see him. He will kill me again, she said. Sajit Singh had been jailed for life for murdering his wife and her brother, but freed after 10 years for good behaviour. When they did finally meet in 1975, Rena was nine years old. However, nothing could allay her fears. Only with the greatest reluctance would she pose, perching uneasily on the armrest of Sajit Singh's chair, with the man who claimed was a murderer. When Sajit Singh tried to put his arm around her, she tore herself away. Then Rena met her four children from her previous life, three daughters and one son, and greeted them as joyfully as she had Gurdip's mother, father and sister. Number 1. Jeremy Anderson, Oklahoma, USA A two-year-old boy from Wacomis, Oklahoma, called Jeremy Anderson, insisted he was Jimmy and not Jeremy. Jeremy was the son of Nancy and Ron Anderson. About a hundred miles from there, at a cemetery in Tokawa, there is a tombstone with the engraved name James L. Hauser, born on August 22, 1952, and died on August 12, 1967. Jeremy Anderson claimed he had been that teenager in a previous life. Jimmy Hauser was raised by his aunt in Tokawa and was killed in a traffic accident on a hot August night in 1967. He was 15 years old. 
One day in 1980, when Jeremy was only five years old, he was leafing through a picture book with his grandmother when he spotted a Ford wagon and then said to his grandmother, hey, that's the wagon that hit me. He then said that he'd been killed and was angry with the man who drove the wagon. One day, he was talking to his grandfather who was lying in bed with a bad back. Jeremy said, what's wrong, Grandpa? Is your back killing you? His gramp said, no, it's not killing me, but it really hurts. Jeremy replied, well, my back got hurt once and it killed me. In April 1980, Jimmy was taken to the scene of the accident. The boy immediately recognised the area and showed how he fell out of the car during the collision. I flew through the air like a bullet and it was like a bomb, he said. According to a police report, Jimmy Hauser and his friend, 16-year-old Kevin Lucas, rode their Buick at over 80 miles per hour. It was claimed that they'd collided the intersection with an old Ford wagon. Their car flew several dozen metres away. Kevin Lucas was seriously injured and Jimmy died at the scene of the accident.